Hello everyone, thanks for joining our session this afternoon called The Sweet Taste of Success, which is about how you can compete effectively in a new world of regulations around high fat, salt and sugar foods. So the UK has got some of the strictest rules in the world already surrounding advertising of high fat, salt and sugar foods and drinks, especially to children. But despite that, the problem of obesity isn't abating. So the COVID-19 pandemic has made us all aware of the impact that obesity can have on people's lives, the social cost of that and the financial cost as well. 77% of all critically ill COVID-19 patients were either overweight or obese. It's also associated with an increased risk of type 2 diabetes, heart disease, stroke, types of cancers and dying prematurely. And to give you an idea of the scale of the problem, one in five children in year six are obese, and that increases to more than one in four children in the most deprived areas. So this is also a problem that's associated with poverty. The new regulations that are coming are bringing about the biggest changes that the industry has seen for years. It's going to impact manufacturers, retailers, and the broader media and creative industry. So what we're going to do today is to bring to you the breadth and depth of the expertise of Kantar. And we're uniquely placed because of that to help guide you through what might feel like tricky waters and to almost see this as an opportunity. My name's Lynn Deason. I'm the head of Creative Excellence at Kantar and I'm absolutely delighted to be chairing a panel of awesome Kantar experts today. We're going to outline what the regulations are, the scope and the potential impact of them, and then also talk about some ways in which we feel you can seize that opportunity. As we go through, please do post your questions in the Q&A chat and we'll get back to you. So let me introduce our fabulous experts. Um, unfortunately, one of our team is poorly and can't be here today, uh, Ruth. Um, so we will be standing in for Ruth. Um, we've got Mark Stanley, who's the head of innovation here with us today. Kathy, who heads up nutrition and public sector for World Panel. And Hannah, who is the head of our media team in the Insights Division. And Ruth is Director of Consulting and Commercial Strategy. So a good place to start is about understanding um, a bit about your role, Cathy, because you work with um, the government and with industry in this area quite specifically. Can you tell us a bit about your role, please? Yeah, thank you, Lynn, for that introduction. Yes, I work with government, academia and the food industry on nutrition and health related um, projects and issues. An assessment of government policy is a really key part of that. So we've had the soft drinks industry levy. We're now talking about HFSS, today's topic. Um, at Cantar World Panel, we collect the purchasing data so we know who's buying what, but we also collect the nutrient content data of, of take home food and drink products. And that allows us to code up the nutrient profiling model score, which is the model that the government use to, to decide whether a product's HFSS or, or not. So combining that insight allows us to really talk about um, um, detailed insight on the HFSS landscape. Okay, thanks. Um, I mean, it feels like this is a bit of an ever evolving beast. It keeps changing, but can you tell us where things stand at the moment in terms of the regulations? Well, this is part of the government's um, obesity strategies. You talked at the beginning how important this is. And it, we've already seen the sugar reduction work, including the soft drinks industry levy, the calorie reduction programme. So it's just part of that. And this is now a restriction on the marketing of high fat, salt and um, sugar foods in certain categories. Um, it's been discussed before, but as you said, that the, um, the relationship between COVID outcomes has really pushed this to the fore. Now, the categories involved in this policy are the ones that you might expect. We've got confectionery, biscuits, cakes, puddings, soft drinks, but also breakfast cereals and yogurts. And on the savoury side, we've got crisps and snacks, um, pizzas, ready meals and battered and breaded products. So quite a comprehensive um, section of sector of the, of the take home baskets. And HFSS, as I mentioned, is using the nutrient profiling model, which is a published government model. And there it assigns points to products based on their nutrient content. So the higher the points, the less healthy the product. And HFSS is defined by having four or more points if you're a food and one or more points if you're a drink. So it's a hard cutoff. 
And there are two key main areas of this policy. There's one in store, and that is restricting the promotions and the placement of these HFSS products within the category. So no more gondola end, no more in store, uh, in the lobby area, no more secondary siting allowed for these products and no more volume promotions. So again, no multi-buys allowed in this policy. So it is quite broad and that impacts on the environment of the retailer quite a bit, but we've also got the implications for the online areas because it's the same for online and that's going to require more of a technical um, solution to the issues there because of the checkout page and the way that we buy online. So those are two key areas but there's another area on the media side which Hannah will talk about later but there's a now a new 9pm TV watershed for all these products and no paid for online advertising. And the category list in the media side has been extended a little bit to include out of home meals, as you might expect um, in that area. And in terms of timing, the in-store um, in, in terms of promotions and placement comes in October next year and the media restrictions come in at the end of next year, end of 2022. So can you help us understand what the scope of that is in sort of tangible terms? Yes, because as I mentioned, we collect purchasing and the nutrient content data, we're able to scale it. And we know at the first point that 40% of spend of take home baskets in an average year will be on HFSS products. So that's huge. Mm -hmm. When we actually limit it to the policy categories, then we're down to 15%, but that is still worth 17 billion pounds a year. So, I mean, the difference between the 15 and 40 is things like meat and dairy products. So we're still talking about a sizable chunk of the business that's yeah. going to be impacted. So how is that likely to affect different categories? What's, what, how will the scope vary? Well, some of the categories are virtually all HFSS, like confectionery, biscuits, cake, etc. So we're talking about a category response. That's going to be everything in that category. But interestingly, there are some categories where there's a mix. And in fact, there are more non-HFSS products than HFSS. So those that are compliant will actually have an advantage. And we know that only about 10% of ready meals are HFSS, much lower than most people think. And even things like cereals, we're talking about less than 40% of breakfast cereals are HFSS. So it's really is, is quite different by category. And there's an other interesting dynamic is about how close some of these categories are to the threshold, the HFSS threshold. So you think confectionery is at 24, so you know, hard to reformulate. But crisps, you can see some crisp products at, with a score of about six, so they're getting very close. To, to the threshold and we'd anticipate a lot of reformulation in those categories. I mean you talked about um, you know the categories that this would impact. I know yourself and Ruth spend a lot of time working with retailers. What do the what do you think the implications are for them? Well, I think there's an immediate operational um, issue for the retailers about how you identify products that are HFSS. I think that will be overcome with agencies like ourselves, as well as suppliers feeding in information, but it is a big task to overcome in the initial stages. And then it's what do you do with the space? So the space at the HFSS products, particularly on gondola end, you've got supplier income that's very important to the retailers. What's going to replace that? And then on the shelf, will the HFSS products need more space on shelf because they've obviously got promotions? Mm -hmm. Um, and you could find that non-HFSS products, so HFSS compliant products, may lose space on shelf just to make, just to, to accommodate those changes. So it's going to be a space allocation, I think, going forward for the retailers. Yeah, interesting. I can imagine some replenishment challenges in those categories, which might be why they would need more, more space, space, as you were saying, Cathy. Yeah. Yes. Um, so you said there were some promotional impacts as well. Do we have an idea of the scale of that? Well, interestingly, this is an area that's sort of least concerned to the industry because we've been seeing volume promotions reducing for some time. And in fact, we're seeing less than 6% of spend of the HFSS products in the categories, policy categories, has a volume promotion today. So it, there is going to be some change there. But because you are still allowed to do TPRs, and that's 31%, almost a third with a price reduction, this isn't so much of an issue for the industry, it's much more about the, the lack of space, the seasonal um, for products and the lack of gondola end. I mean, the promotional impact, although it's significant, it isn't quite as big as I, I feared it might be. Um, but that impact on supplier income is potentially enormous. Um, 
you know, I think you've hinted there are some opportunities as well as, you know, downsides. Um, what do you think retailers need to, su to do, Mark, to succeed? Well, I guess ultimately we need to start thinking about how our, how our customers are going to react to, to this kind of change, how their shopping behaviour is going to start evolving and changing. And you think there's some big seasonal events, for example, where how aisles are kind of laid out in a certain way, which are going to be pretty impacted by some of the HFSS um, guidelines. So I think it's an opportunity for retailers to start thinking, how do I kind of reevaluate the use of my, my space? Do I merchandise some of my products differently? Um, and I think in that space, there's some quite exciting potential solutions available. For example, could you perhaps go for more mission-based um, uh, layouts in in-store, mission-based um, opportunities? So I think there's an opportunity to work in quite a creative way to solve to solve this problem. And we know um, you're the head of innovation, um, and it, it sounds like you know innovation could be a great route for brands to succeed in this space. Um, would you agree with that? Or well, is that a too obvious question for you? <laughs> well, I, I, am, I am head of innovation, so of course I'm going to say yes. But genuinely, when consumers and consumer landscape change, there's always opportunity. And Kathy mentioned um, reformulation and renovation. I think our minds will first go to some of those defensive places. And there may be some categories where that's, where that's possible, but the gaps may be too big for certain categories. And equally, the... This might be simply the start of, of government intervention as, as well, perhaps. So to me, a much better approach is to take more of a, a growth mindset, let, let, let's say. See this as an opportunity. As these government interventions come in, the landscape and context of consumers will change. That will change their attitudes and ultimately start to change their behaviours as well. So within that backdrop, how do you start to really kind of launch more meaningful innovations and start to really kind of lead lead the change, perhaps? So you touched there on meaningful innovations. What do you mean by that? Well, I think meaningful innovations are innovations that are tapping into new new demand spaces, for example. So that's why I'd look first. What is what is this changing consumer consumer landscape? What are the new demand pools that are, are coming up? Now we do a lot of digital trends tracking, for example. That's a fantastic way to look at kind of more emergent um, opportunities and see how that consumer context is, is changing. What you then want to start doing is iteratively, iteratively developing meaningfully different innovation for a series of rap rapid and smart experiments. And then bring those new innovations to market as quickly as you can using kind of very much a test and learn, learn mindset as a, you want to get first to market in quite a changing a changing context. In terms of where some of that meaningful and di differentiated innovation may sit, um, I think we've got to look a little bit wider than just HFSS. I think it'll be an accelerant to the big macro trend around health and wellbeing, for example. So we've seen the growth of um, sustainable products, uh, people buy more locally, perhaps, mm -hmm. as well. We've continued to see this holistic kind of health and wellbeing and mental health kind of trend as as well. So I think that's a, a real opportunity and businesses and brands are starting to tap into some of these areas. We can already see growing quite, quite significantly. Another example, if we look at snack foods, um, there's a whole range of different snack foods already looking at some of these areas. So here's just some examples, kale, crisps, um, olive snack packs, veggie sticks, um, for example, and something I saw a couple of weeks ago, urgent urban legends, which are apparently are the world's first HFSS um, donut. And that's from one of the founders of, of Grays as, as, as well. So loads of opportunities out there. I guess the challenge for manufacturers is how can you really kind of look to your MPD to up your contribution to healthier baskets? And when you're doing that, how do you make that a frictionless choice for customers? So they start to make make that shift and that that, that frictionless choice we call frictionless okay. innovation. Great. I think one final thing to mention as well is whilst I've talked a lot about health foods there, I think we're still gonna want our little treats. I enjoy a little little kind of bit of indulgence now and then. I think we're all gonna be be the same on that. So there's still opportunities for, for innovation in some of those more treatier areas, but you just need to be mindful of this change in the consumer context. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'll certainly be up for a treat still. <laughs> I'm with you there, Mark. Um, although I do like the sound of those um, 
healthier donuts. I think my children will enjoy those as well. Um, I thought it was interesting, you know, looking at those products that you've just shown us, they look quite premium. I know that's consistent with some findings from the Food Foundation's Broken Plate Report last year. And they found on average that healthy foods were three times more expensive than their calorie high counterparts. You know, as I was alluding to at the beginning, we know that obesity is an issue associated with poverty. So it feels there should also be an opportunity here for brands and retailers to really, you know, if they're going to make a positive change, they need to make those products affordable and uh, desirable and accessible to, to people on lower incomes as well. Um, so you talked about frictionless innovation. What does that phrase mean? Well, it's very much as, as you were saying there, Lynn, it's about we've lent on um, behavioral science. I kind of feel about if you're gonna tr create consumer change, you need to make it a frictionless choice. So that's removing the frictions and driving the fuels. Now we look at this using a simple kind of free, free area model. First of all, you need to make it easy for people. So you remove all those frictions. So cost, as you were saying, let's not make this significantly more expensive. Let's remove the hassle factor. So it's not hard to kind of find or access some of these products. Let's not make people feel they're having a, a compromised choice as well, perhaps. You then need to motivate people, kind of fuel them to, to, to make that change. So I thought about meaningfully different innovations. Do that, making sure you're tapping into real consumer needs in a very differentiated way. Make sure you're um, looking at consumers' value and belief systems. Are you, are you tapping into those and aligning against those? And equally make those innovations socially desirable as well. Then finally, you need to reward people, right? You need to cement their, their behavior. So make sure you're delivering on your, your promise. If you're making uh, claims about the, how tasty your product is in a, in a healthier space, make sure you're delivering on that promise. Make sure the whole uh, experience and the total experience is, is really positive for, for consumers. Yeah, I completely agree. You, know, you set up those expectations, you've definitely got to um, deliver against those, haven't you? Um, in this new regulated world, I wonder if it will be more challenging to take, you know, NPD and new ideas to retailers. Um, how do you think brands can do that successfully to take that innovation to retailers? Well, I think the first thing to say is be proactive. We often hear that retailers feel there's a lack of real kind of industry changing and disruptive innovation out there and people perhaps not taking a cross category viewpoint. So whilst nobody obviously has the answers, be willing to agilely test and learn with with retailers and and try and try things out. Um, I think some of the areas I was talking about making sure your innovations are rooted in real kind of real consumer need is going to ap appeal to to the retailers. Work through how you um, announce and land those innovations in 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 store again by partnering um, with the retailers. Make sure. You're um, bringing these to life through creative execution and creative cons to create that demand. Ultimately, retailers are here to fulfill consumers' needs, wants, desires, very much as, as, as you are as manufacturers as well. So they're here to support you in creating this positive change, I'd say. Yeah. You know, you make me think about um, retailers as brands as well. You know, and if you look at the, the retail landscape now and the kind of communications, the activities that brands have got in place, a lot of them are trying to be quite purposeful in this space. And I know you talk, Kathy, about, you know, the impact on space utilization. You know, maybe that combination of innovation and repurposing space for good could create an opportunity for retailers to differentiate themselves, perhaps. Um, so what about communications then, Hannah? What are the implications there? Well, so the biggest implication is this no uh, product HFSS advertising before nine o'clock on TV. And what that means is it's going to increase demand for those post watershed slots. So the then the price of those slots is going to go up, not just for the impacted brands, but also for all advertisers. Right. So you could start to see increased you know, spend going into TV after this point. And also it's going to cost people a lot more to do that. Mm. The other thing is the proposed complete ban on digital advertising, which is huge <laughs> um, for all, all the categories involved. So those are big changes. Um, so it's worth thinking about other touch points that can be used and um, kind of experimenting with those and thinking about how you can get the right creative for the right context and making sure that you're really delivering against those 
um, KPIs that you might have to ensure you can still do that. The important thing to remember is that master brand advertising is still allowed. So as long as it's not focused on the product um, and that can be really impactful at driving things like awareness as well as brand consideration, which then can go on to influence how people make decisions when they're in store. So that's really important as well. And, you know, we've seen great examples. If we think about the famous Cadbury Gorilla ad as an example, uh, at the time that came out, we tested that using our link creative testing solution. And it proved to have a really good impact at um, driving Cadbury's positioning around joy amongst consumers. And then they had a number of other ads after that that were also really successful. So if you're not thinking about master brand and you're very reliant on product marketing at the moment, it's worth thinking about how you can use master brand to drive your overall strategy uh, going forwards. Yeah, that's a potentially a great opportunity, isn't it, to still build those associations. Um, and from an enhancement point of view as well in this category, that can be particularly important. You know, like thinking about, you talked about joy for Cadbury's, you know, for Galaxy, it would be that silky experience and um, brand communications play a really important role in planting those seeds in people's minds. So when they experience the product, they, they experience it as in that silky way. Exactly. Um, what else do retailers and brands need to know, do you think? So I'd say there's probably three key things. So the first one is, whilst this is a big change and these, you know, these changes in uh, regulations are going to have a big impact. When we look at research that we've done around food and drink categories, we actually found that it's not paid for activity that's having the biggest contribution to something like brand strength for these brands. It's actually earned media. So actually, whilst you know, these implications are wide ranging and big, it's not the main contributor for brand strength. So that's, I think, a really important thing. It's not the end of the world. Uh, there are going to be ways that we can work with these regulations and make them work for us. Um, I'd say the second thing is, um, with, you know, these brands aren't going to be the first to operate in a restricted category. Well, there's lots we can learn from what's already happened in the past. And when we look at some of these other areas that have been restricted, we see um, some of these earned um, media options having a real impact. So things like um, product experience, word of mouth from family and friends, um, earned and owned social media, um, as well as the brand website or the online store or whatever it would be. So experience is going to be key there as well. So um, it's not all about, um, you know, it, they're not discovering this for the first time. There's other brands that have gone through this already. So there's definitely some stuff that we can learn there. And, it, you know, again, it's going to be about testing and learning, working what works for you um, as well. And then the other thing is um, we can still use TV and digital when we're thinking about our master brand. Um, so there's definitely, you know, that's important and we can work with that. When we're thinking about product messaging, then there's going to be other touch points we can rely on, as well as the post watershed spots that we can still purchase. Right. So there's definitely, you know, areas where we can think, how does my strategy need to change if I'm thinking about master brand? How does it need to change in, term, in terms of channel choice mm -hmm. for uh, product variant messaging? Um, and so it's still going to be possible um, to have a really high reach, high impact campaign. Um, and it's just thinking about what those things are, as well as, you know, each channel has strengths and weaknesses. So am I trying to drive awareness, perceptions or motivation to purchase? And that's going to impact my channel choice as well. So there's lots that feeds into this media planning, but it's already very complex already. So people are used to kind of working with this and making it work for them. Mm. So as like I say, there was three main things for media, but from a creative point of view, Lynn, you're our creative expert in the room. Um, what are the implications uh, in terms of that? We well, talked about brand building, which makes me think about consistency. And I think actually in a HFSS regulated world, consistency across all encounters becomes you know, even more important because brands only exist in our heads as a set of associations. So each encounter we have whether it's communications or whether it's online or word of mouth, as you were saying, is an opportunity to, to either reinforce those if they're consistent or perhaps undermine them. So we'd say there's three key things to focus on to do this well. Um, you need to have clarity of the brand's uh, vision of its strategy and what you want to achieve. Uh, bringing that to life then through a creative platform that you use consistently can be a brilliant way to achieve that as well. You talked about the, the Cadbury Joyful mm. idea being used um, across lots of different channels. 
and knowing what your brand cues are and integrating those consistently is also a, a really important thing to think about to achieve that consistency. Um, but of course, the same foundations of success still apply as they would do before the regulations came along. So each ad has got to earn its own place. It's got to be effective in isolation. Um, you need that creative consistency over time as well. So that's the point I was saying about committing to a campaign. Um, and then that multi-channel synergy. I know you've seen evidence of how important that is, mm -hmm. Hannah, you know, to, for people to be able to glue things together when they experience them really makes a difference. So that's, that's everything we wanted to cover today in terms of kind of points of view. If you haven't already done so, please do post your questions in the Q&A chat and we'll get back to you. Um, I know this is a challenging time, you know, it's something we, we've all discussed together, but hopefully you can now see this also as an opportunity. Um, they say out of something bad, something good always comes. And I think with, the, with creativity, it can certainly be the case here. Um, take the opportunity to start piloting now. I think that's something we've all covered today. Mm. Um, and, you know, have confidence that what you know and believe is still the same. So there's fundamentals in terms of what it takes to succeed aren't really going to change. Um, I think in our discussions, we certainly agreed that seeing this as a holistic business challenge is important. You know, it would be easy to be siloed and for each team individually to be tackling this challenge. But having that united front in terms of the strategy, but also those common goals could really make a difference here. Um, and I think it's an opportunity for brands and retailers to lead the agenda in this space. You know, we outlined the need for change. And I know, Cathy, you're close to, to the legislation and the changes that are happening. Um, we've seen this from an inclusion and diversity point of view. You know, um, creative agencies have actively taken steps to be more um, diverse and more positive in their portrayal of people. And it is making a difference. So the same can be true here. And, you know, we know that if this doesn't happen, sure, more legislation will come. Now, it's incredible. There have been 689 policies trying to deal with this issue in the last 29 years. I think there's definitely momentum here. Um, and you know, we've talked a lot about the UK, but this isn't a UK issue. This is a global issue. Um, rates of obesity are high in the US, Mexico, Europe. And even in India, there's legislation around being able to show advertisements in proximity to schools. So the UK is potentially a really great test bed to learn from, you know, to experiment and to upskill in areas that you're not quite so good at or you don't feel you are. So perhaps, Hannah, you know, thinking about some of the touch points you might not know so well, yeah. experiment now, learn how to do that really well and get ahead of the game. Um, so part of what we're doing is exploring different ways that we can help clients with this topic. Um, we're considering roundtables as one route that we could do that, you know, bringing our holistic expertise to you as a holistic team. So if you think that's something that could be of benefit, you know, let us know. But equally, if you've got other ideas of, of how we can help, um, reach out to us either individually or in the Q&A. Many thanks and thanks to the experts here today. Thank you.